Welcome. Thank this you. is J.D. Flynn. He is all around a good person. He works on the community health team at um, on the community working group community health team as a subject matter expert. Uh, he is a developer at an agency, nerdery, and you are listening to I Am Functional and So Can You. That was a nice podcast intro. <laughs> we have a lovely podcast, <laughs> All right, so, um, yeah, welcome. Thank you for coming here. As she said, I am JD. You can find me, Dorf on the Slacks, uh, JD does dev in the Twitters, on Drupal.org, uh, Dorficus, I'm extremely hireable, and I am possibly two Velociraptors in a human suit, possibly not. So, a little bit more about me. Uh, well, I've been doing Drupal and PHP for about eight years now. Uh, before that, I was doing HTML since the 90s. Uh, had the, the best sound lip website in my class in high school. Uh, I learned some basic around the same time, and I learned that through a magazine called 321 Contact. If any of you heard that or remember the show. In the back, they used to have a, of the magazine, not the show, they used to have a program written out that you would have to look at, type out, look at, type out, and mess up something. So I learned coding uh, a little bit at, through that. A lot of debugging, too. Um, before all this, or before becoming a developer, I was a paramedic EMT firefighter for about 10 years. Uh, as Amy June said, I'm a member of the community working group community health team. And I am also your friendly neighborhood code of conduct point of contact, in which uh, April mentioned this morning. In addition to that, I consider myself knowledgeable about the mentally ill because I myself am mentally ill. And if you have mental illness, then you need to know that you're not alone. So I need to start off with a disclaimer because people in this country like to sue for lots of things. I'm not saying any of you would, but just covering my, my butt here. Not a medical professional. I'm not preventing, providing medical advice. I'm just a guy standing in a room looking at some great people and talking with you. Another disclaimer is I try to keep this PG-13, uh, which I think the MPAA allows one F-bomb and tasteful nudity, I'm going to forego the nudity and potentially <laughs> a second F-bomb, maybe a third. Uh, so, sorry in advance. All right, question. Why are we here? Can you see that, the light from the projector? I am sorry. Uh, so I'll read it since it's a little bit difficult to see with the, the projector. I've got a few slides that look somewhat like this. Um, so why are we here? It's a loaded question. Uh, and I'm not here to cause an ex existential crisis regarding the meaning of life and our place in the grand scheme of the universe. You can do that on your own time. Uh, I'm here to talk with you about us. It means I'm not here to lecture or say how great I am because I'm barely managing, but I'm here to have a conversation. Just because I have a slideshow and the mouse doesn't mean that I'm the most important person in the room. I wouldn't be up here without all of you wanting to be a part of the conversation. And maybe that conversation will happen while I'm up here. Um, maybe it'll happen after. Maybe it'll happen with someone who isn't me. And more importantly, if one person in this room realizes or helps someone else realize they aren't alone, I call that a win. And I'm also giving this because a talk, much better than this one, but similar, uh, helped me get help. And it kind of changed my life. Um, before we get into how I am functional, and again, I'm sorry about the coloring on the projector. I'm going to take a few moments to brag about the diagnosis I've collected so far. And maybe brag isn't the correct word, but what the hell. Um, depression, uh, otherwise known as major depressive disorder, common and serious mood disorder, and those who suffer from depression experience persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness and lose interest in activities they once enjoyed. At least you can see the memes. Um, so yeah, this is kind of how I felt, feel sometimes. Uh, for anybody who can't see it, uh, it says, wow, today is great, la 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 la, and hmm, wish I was never born. It's uh, not as bad as it used to be, but I do have that feeling, and I had a lot more before. I've got ADHD, which is 
A persistent pattern of inattention or hyperactivity or impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. This is kind of my representation of it. Should be paying attention to work that I should be doing, but anything that isn't what I should be doing is always screaming at me to do something else. Um, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder. It's triggered by a terrifying event, not necessarily, it's not specific to the military, it could happen to anybody, uh, either through experiencing or witnessing the event. And the symptoms may include flashbacks, nightmares, anxiety, as well as uncontrollable thoughts about the event. Um, a psychologist that I used to see gave me a real good example. We all know computers here, right? So computers have the hard drive, which is long-term storage, and the RAM, which is really short-term storage, but it moves really fast between the processor. When somebody has PTSD, the memory gets stuck in that short-term memory, in the RAM of your brain. And it's just really easy to recall it at the slightest trigger, uh, sight, smell, sound, anything. So that's why people relive it, because it's stuck there. And part of the treatment is to help move the memory into the longer-term storage. Anxiety. Um, Characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. People with anxiety usually have recurring intrusive thoughts or concerns. They may avoid certain situations out of worry, and they may also have physical symptoms such as sweating, trembling, dizziness, or rapid heartbeat. Anxiety can also take many different forms. Um, irritability, that's because anxiety comes from your amygdala or your lizard brain, and so when a lizard gets cornered, or let me back up. Because somebody with anxiety, and it comes from that lizard brain, it's easy to trigger the fight or flight response, which, uh, you know, when a lizard gets cornered, it's either going to bite at you or run away. And so, since we don't really run away, there's a lot of just lashing out and, what do you want? Obsessive behaviors, um, overscheduling or overworking. Does anybody in here do that? <laughs> uh, for me, it's because I felt that if I didn't put in extra work, I was doing something wrong and I wasn't keeping up with everybody. Overindulgence, um, yeah, that happens. Dizziness or numbness. Now, sometimes that happens more in an acute panic attack. And when that happens, somebody's hyperventilating they're breathing off the carbon dioxide from their body and that messes with the whole body chemistry so your your body starts feeling dizzy and numb. Sleepiness or insomnia, either or. It could be either one of them. So that's really hard to uh, tell uh, which one it is. Lack of concentration, because if you're always in a state of panic, it's gonna be hard to concentrate. And avoidance. Uh, these are all what anxiety may look like but not a limited list or not a, an all-inclusive list. So, time for some humble brags. Uh, why do I consider myself functional now? It's hard to put into words what I mean by functional, and I don't mean standard functional member of society, because society kind of sucks right now, uh, but it's easier to explain why I wasn't functional. Uh, work was a big one. I dreaded every day because I didn't think I deserved a job. There were thousands of people out there uh, that all were better than me, smarter than me, knew what they were doing, and that meant it must have been a mistake that they were going to figure out and fire me at any time to hire one of those thousands of people. Uh, anyone know what that kind of feeling is called? Oh. Exactly, yeah. Uh, it, that's a big one, especially in tech community. Well, I, I guess it's big everywhere, uh, but yeah, it, it was horrible. Um, I was extremely frightened of everything. Like, would I be fired for something I forgot to do? Uh, like, be as good as the other thousands of people who were better than me? Or things that, looking back, are kind of ridiculous, at least to me. Like, is that space between the bed and the wall big enough for me to fall into, get trapped, and suffocate because of the blanket? Um, and I would have that kind of reaction. And it, the reaction was, I mean, since we're in Nashville, I'll use a bear as an example. The reaction I would have to a space between the wall and the bed is the same reaction that somebody getting chased by a bear might have, uh, at least physiologically. Um, 
Because I was frightened, my fight or flight instinct took hold and I would lash out angrily a lot. And because I was frightened, I was afraid to speak up or go against what other people said, no matter how ridiculous their suggestions might be. Um, I had an extremely hard time focusing on anything that mattered. I mean, I could spend hours trying to beat Super Mario World and get all the stars uh, without so much as a bathroom break, but 15 minutes of coding, despite how much I love doing it, was too much and I'd find my way down some tw Twitter rabbit hole or something else that might take me distracted. And personal relationships, yeah, a uh, complete mystery. I had no idea how to have them. And I used to have just a couple friends, but nobody that I would really let in to be part of my life. Nobody really knew me. Um, so even my best friends were more acquaintances than friends. And a lot of times those personal relationships would failed uh, spectacularly because of some misunderstanding on my part. Now, why do I consider my functional now? Well, for the most part, I can hold a job, I think. Um, I'm not afraid of everything anymore, mostly just bats. Uh, and I'm not nearly as angry about everything as I used to be. I think I'm more grumpy now than angry, uh, except when it comes to people who use the word literally when they don't mean literally. That makes me mad. Um, I don't freak out about everything. And in case you're wondering, I never fell in that space between the bed and the wall. I survived. Most days I can focus and get things done that need to be done, assuming distractions are kept to a minimum. And I'll talk about those distractions a little bit later. I can communicate more gooder. And I, I have some personal relationships. I have some people that I call friends. Uh, and I don't just mean acquaintances. Some of them in this room here. Thank you for coming. And I'm going to break them down a little bit later. Now that, uh, again, the vision on the slide, sorry. How did I become functional? And just so you know, on my screen, I did a, a colorblind <laughs> test. And so I, I try to make this as accessible as, any, or as I could. Um, <laughs> all right, so step one, realize there is a problem. I live the majority of my life in denial. Um, my childhood, I don't want to go into too much detail, but it was less than great. So I didn't really have a basis for what normal should look like. Uh, and that was up until I was about 30, I'd say, that I, I lived in denial. And then it took a panic attack that prevented me from going to a class uh, and a bit of a health scare to realize that maybe there was something wrong. I, I had to take a look in the mirror, realize that maybe me being angry all the time isn't everybody else's fault. Uh, kind of the thing where, you know, if everywhere you go smells like dog shit, maybe look at your own shoes. And I had to you know, take, a, take a step back and think, hey, maybe, maybe it is me. Step two, I had to address the problems. Um, it wasn't enough for me to just say, hey, something isn't right. Let's just keep on keeping on. I made doctor's appointments. I started therapy, eventually started medications. And those all helped out a lot. Now, with this addressing the problem, a quote from one of my favorite podcasters uh, from last podcast on the left is, mental illness is not your fault, but it is your responsibility. If you have mental illness, you're not to blame for it. However, if you, if you deny it and whatever treatment you may, may need to be functional, then it kind of does fall on you. So it's not your fault that you have a disease, but if you're not going to get treated, that is your fault. And finally, step three, through... Who knows? There's no simple process. Um, it's taken a lot of hard work, a lot of failure, and a lot of drugs, I mean medication, to help me get where I am. And these are just suggestions that really help me out, and maybe they'll be of use to you, I hope. So another disclaimer, because um, disclaimers save my ass. These work for me, but that doesn't mean they're right for you. All of us are on our own journey. And what helped one person may not be the solution for someone else. Find what works for you. So for me, therapy was huge. And I personally think everyone should try therapy at some point. Uh, sure, it's paying someone to listen to your problem, something that a friend might do. But the real value comes from questions a good therapist asks. Now they help you deal with that uh, problem or those problems. Uh, for me, there's a lot of talk therapy. Uh, some CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, kind of 
retraining the brain to not have as many negative thoughts. Uh, and it helped out a lot. Medication. I am a big fan of better living through chemistry and I take meds for my illness, just like someone with heart problems or diabetes should take meds for theirs. And it took a while to find the right combo, but eventually we, and by we I mean my doctor and I, not just me and some guy on the street, uh, we found the right combo. Now, if you do try medication with the consent of a doctor, uh, give it time to work. First few weeks of a new med can be rough, but, and it may not be the right one for you, but when things level out, you'll definitely see improvement if that's the path that someone chooses. Now, these are great for regular life, but I have some suggestions that help me at work. Uh, before I get too far into this, um, I'd like to know a little bit about all of you. How many of you are developers work with code? Okay. Um, project managers, anything? <laughs> Jack to Jill's of all trades, it <laughs> seems, yeah. Um, all right, so uh, one thing that really helped me, and the reason I'm asking that is because I have an example that I wanna make sure that I'm catering to my audience with, other than just skipping over, uh, breaking down tasks. And real question for you, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Exactly. Um, but as a vegan, I don't condone the eating of elephants for comedic purposes or any other. Um, so try and figure out the smaller parts that can be accomplished on their own. And for those developers may recognize that this is also functional instead of procedural. Um, and most of all, don't get overwhelmed by the big picture. It's definitely easy to get distracted and freak out like I do all the time. But once I can reel in my lizard brain and realize that something can be broken down, Things go a lot smoother and I spend less time crying on the floor and more time crying in my chair. So here's an example of just a, something that we might run into as developers to break down tasks. Um, you've been asked to create a custom module in Drupal specific that allowed, or that involved allowing a user to paste HTML generated by an external source. Let's just say they're working with some weird uh, CRM that won't hook up to an API, um, take that and paste it into a text field, and then that HTML has to be parsed and inserted, and the data from it is inserted into various fields of content type. This has a lot of moving parts, and it's easy to go down rabbit holes, but any ideas how we could break down this task? This isn't a coding interview either. <laughs> Just... yeah, it, um, identify the, the structure of the HTML that's generated by the HTML. Yeah. So that you can identify the patterns in the HTML that you need to be able to parse out to yeah. into your custom. Field. So that could be a subtask of it, something smaller. Maybe creating the custom content type. Uh, um, I was backing <laughs> into creating the custom content type. By knowing something about the yeah. HTML that was coming in. So and yes. breaking down the content type to something smaller, what kind of fields are we going to use for <laughs> set up the field? So things can be broken down. And I, like I said, I don't want to go down too many rabbit holes here because I'm sure that we could debate all day about the best way to go about this. Um, but uh, yeah, this helps me out a lot. I get a lot of tasks that are pretty large and the requirements are pretty um, non specific. <laughs> Uh, do any of you have that fun where the client doesn't really know what they want to tell you? Yeah, so that's kind of what I, I get a lot, so I have to break those tasks down and spend a little time doing that. Another thing that really helps me, kind of along the same lines here, are is making lists. Planning your day might be easier if you start by making a list of what needs to be accomplished, and if there's stuff you don't get to, move it on to the next day's list. I do this a lot. Um, I've got a yellow legal pad that I will write down what I need to do in a day. Um, and you know, I, I have used something called a Panda Planner once in a while that uh, does pretty much the same thing. You can make a list of what's important, what you need to get done that day. Uh, which, I mean, those help me because I feel like everything that I cross off that list is something that I've accomplished and something that I've been able to do uh, successfully. 
Another big one, communicate more gooder. And this one is hard for me because I don't know about you, but I tend to read text-based communication in the most negative tone possible, no matter what somebody's saying. If somebody even types so much as have a nice day, I read it you know, like the, a villain in an action movie who just shot somebody off the corner or off, off a cliff. Have a nice day. Um, but don't assume the worst. However, unless the, other, the person on the other end is a complete and total jackass, you might want to assume the worst, but ordinarily don't. Um, how many of you use Slack or Teams or something similar to work? Okay, just about everybody, yeah. So I know on Slack, there's a little switch for huddle, and that makes FaceTime and VoiceTime that much easier. You can talk to people. Uh, I mean, right now, and for the past few years, remote work has been pretty much everything for all of us. And it's easy to get lost and forget that we're people. And you know, if you're just going back and forth with text-based communication, that could be read wrong. I mean, see, <laughs> see line A. Don't assume the worst. Uh, but five minutes of taking time to talk, have FaceTime with somebody, that could, well, save a trip to HR and probably resolve confusion a lot better. Um, with that, this was, what the hell, all of these were very hard for me to do. <laughs> I'm going to say this is, this was a hard one for me, but I'll just, you know, blanket statement here. All these are difficult. Um, I was very afraid to ask for clarification because I thought that I was an idiot if I didn't know what somebody was talking about. Uh, but it turns out that clients and non-tech people may not know how to put things in tech words and a lot of the times uh, tech people may not know how to put it into non-tech words. So if there's clarification needed, if a client's saying, hey, I want a page with a lot of HTML, H something that I was actually told by a client one time, Give me HTML5 coolness on this page. Um, <laughs> HTML5 coolness. <laughs> um, so I had to ask for clarification. Like, what exactly is it that you want here? What have you seen? Um, but, you know, it, it's there. There's definitely a wall of communication, but you can always ask for clarification. And hopefully, the two parties in the conversation can come to some sort of mutual understanding. And also, take some responsibility for yourself and make sure you aren't using a hostile tone, either with text-based or voice communication. Uh, if you're doing a pull request, something like that, there's a big difference between your code is bad and you should feel bad and, hey, there's some issues here, let's see if we can work through them together. I, like, I love getting a pull request um, and seeing something that isn't is off a little bit because it's a teachable moment. You can take that person and help them out rather than break them down. Uh, and I love it when my pull requests get reviewed like that and somebody has finds an issue that I missed or a better way to do it because it's a teachable moment. Granted, a few years ago, I would have seen any pull request that wasn't immediately merged in as a hostile intention and they wanted me to get fired, but that's not the case. Big one, huge one. Um, we're remote, we communicate by Slack, by Teams, uh, for the most part, I'm assuming a lot here. But one thing that has helped me recently is having dedicated focus, focus time during the workday. Um, I know my days, you know, I've got stand-ups in the morning, I know when I've got weekly statuses with clients, uh, I know, you know other things will come up, but I block out large chunks of time on my calendar and just mark it as focus time. Uh, so that my distractions are kept to a minimum. I turn off my notifications. I close unnecessary, unnecessary tabs, usually. Uh, I lock the door so that nobody walks in that doesn't have any respect for somebody who's working. I turn off my phone notifications, and I put on some music. You know, usually, for me, it's something instrumental, so I don't you know, start typing out, never going to give you up, instead of what I'm actually supposed to be typing. Um, another one that's kind of hard for a lot of us is taking me time. If you have PCO, use it. Don't let it go to waste. Uh, it's yours. Take a day off now and then and take care of yourself. Have a treat yourself day. 
And mental health days are just as important as taking time when you have a cold or a broken leg or you know, anything. Mental health days are health days. <laughs> you need them. It's okay. And it's okay to shut off for a day. And in this case, it's do as I say, not as I do, because I can't shut off for a day. Um, if I spend a day doing nothing, I feel like I've wasted time. But don't listen to me. Take a day off. Feel free to do nothing for a day. All right. So with this, I've given a lot of information. But this is a guide, which you might be able to read on one of these. I think the top one is maybe. Um, this isn't a definitive list of things that will make you better, but these are things that will help me and continue to help me in my day to day. Um, I hope maybe they'll help you, but I want to be clear. I still have very, very rough days, really bad days. And thanks to my treatments and coping mechanisms, they're much less frequent and a lot less intense than they used to be, but they happen. Like if before treatment, my highs were this high and my lows were this low, right now it's about a little bit closer to this wave. Um, so not nearly as bad as I used to be. Uh, there are times when I get overwhelmed and the imposter syndrome takes over. Most of the time I can get through it, but sometimes just being afraid, I'll, I'll leave a message with an idea in Slack as a draft for a week and never get around to pressing send. Uh, I have those days, and I'm not, not afraid to admit it. And most of the time, those get deleted when I have to send a new message. So one thing that I found interesting is those of us with a mental illness are not alone, and we shouldn't be afraid of living with mental illness. With this fact, and I got this just the other day off of Johns Hopkins' website, 26% of Americans aged 18 and older, or about one in four people, suffer from a diagnosable mental disorder in a given year. Now, I gave a talk similar to this in 2019, and that number was around 20%. I don't know what happened between 2019 and now that might have increased depression or mental illness. Um, but, <laughs> but it's gone up, 26%. Um, so that's, that's a huge number. But it also means that we're not alone. Those of us with mental illness, we're not suffering by ourselves. And the other, one other thing that I think is amazing is that the stigma around mental illness, I and mean, there's a lot of celebrities, a lot of more open voices or more recognizable voices who are talking about you know, their own issues with mental illness, their own journeys. So I think the stigma around it compared to 50 years ago when it was lock them up, throw away the key and hope that they don't hurt themselves to now where it's, here I am, take me for me. I think that's amazing. It's, it's a great... Great time to, I almost said it's a great time to have mental illness, which um, uh, maybe not the right way I want to say. It's a great, you all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, so I, just to recap, um, before you can start to become functional, you need to recognize if there's a problem. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But if you have mental illness, you're not alone. Again, 26%, one in four, well, slightly more than one in four. Um, but you're not alone. What works for me may not work for others. I'm not going to tell you to do exactly as I did. I'm not gonna tell you I'll take the exact same meds that I'm on, um, go to the same therapist as me, anything like that. Find what works for you. I, it might be exercise works for some people. It might be walking through the woods. It might be you know, meditation. Whatever works for you works, but you got to recognize it and you got to take care of yourself. And becoming functional for me didn't happen overnight. As I said, it took a long time. There was a lot, a lot, a lot of failure. Um, and there were some very, very hard times. But, I mean, like I said, there's, there's a lot of things I can do now that I couldn't do before. And I'm kind of proud of myself for that. But also, there are bad days. But overall, life is better. Um, I mean, honestly, if I hadn't gotten treatment, if I hadn't started taking care of myself, I would not be standing in front of a room of mostly strangers. I know a few of you, uh, but I'd probably sign up for this and then go cry somewhere, hopefully private, and not make it up here. I, and also, take time when you need time. 
seriously, this is a huge one. And a lot of people, I mean, I hate seeing or hearing about people who let their PTO roll over because they want to, you know, save it or, you know, they, they had to take, they had to work extra hard on a client project. They couldn't take the time off. You know what? It's your PTO. It's your time. Take time off. I don't want to say screw the client because they pay our bills if, and uh, <laughs> make sure that we get paid, but you got to take time for yourself. And most of all, no matter how you may feel about yourself, all of you are amazing people and you have my respect for coming to this. Thank you for coming to this talk, sharing your time with me, taking part in a conversation even though I did most of the talking. And I want to say thank you all. I'm going to open up. If there are any questions, um, feel free to ask. I, I'll do what I can to answer. Not a question, but a comment. You're welcome. I need to. Yes, Amy June. Okay, I know you. Yes, you do. Okay. Um, and I, I think I know a lot about how you react to things at this point in our relationship. And um, cognitive behavioral therapy is something that I can't seem to wrap my head around. So was that something that you struggled with when you first? Therapy. Yeah, and I still struggle with it okay. a little bit. And I honestly, pandemic times, I I've strayed away from seeing a therapist because I don't feel the same relationship as being in a room yeah. with somebody, right. having that actual face to face, rather than you know, either on my phone or in my home office on Zoom. Um, but it's it's difficult because for me, a lot of the times, it's like, uh, you know, hey, uh, my my inner voice, the intrusive thoughts, and. Does everybody know or anybody know what I mean by intrusive thoughts? Mm -hmm. Things that you think that you think you shouldn't be thinking, but you think them anyway. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're a serial killer or uh, anything like that. It's just your brain saying, hey, I'm going to mess with you for a little bit. But, you know, I have the intrusive thoughts of you're an idiot. Nobody likes you. Uh, give up now. And for me, initially, I thought that uh, the CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Training Therapy, was more like a telling yourself, oh, hey, you're not an idiot. You shouldn't give up now. It's just adding an extra negative to it. And that didn't really work. But it was, it, like you said, it was hard to grasp. But the more I kind of had to repeat that stuff to me, myself, um, it didn't work 100%. I mean, I still have those thoughts. But I can push them aside a lot more than I could. But it, took, it did take you some time. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think recognition is the biggest form of that. Yeah. Like, you understand your your thought trains, kind of what I refer to them as, and you see you're going down this hole and you're like, wait, I'm going down this way. Exactly. Take a, take a turn. Take yeah. A yeah, they're, uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I have, I have intrusive thoughts and some of them are pretty damn dark, but uh, again, that's not me thinking whatever they are. Uh, it's just my brain seeing how bad it can mess with me. Uh, like you said, it is recognition that that's not really a thing, but let's move past it. Do uh, you think that, that working from home has gave you, or I don't know if you're tired or work from home, but do you think it's given you more of a space to work on those intrusive thoughts and take time for yourself rather than going to the office every day? And have you taken a step back a little bit more? So, uh, and I'm going to repeat that because kind of quiet in the back, um, but just so that the, the thing can pick it up. The question was, has working remotely made it easier to push aside the intrusive thoughts and focus on my own? Um, for me, I, I prefer a hybrid work environment where I can work from home, but home has a lot of distractions. That's where I got my Switch, that's where I've got my Xbox, that's where I've got my gaming PC, right next to my work PC, <laughs> that it's really easy to just hit a button, hit a button, oh, I'm playing something now for the next two hours. Um, it's easier to get distracted at home, but having that space where I know that I'm, I, I have safe space, where you know, I'm comfortable, I can be myself here, I don't have to worry about you know somebody, a boss <laughs> walking by in the office, you know, judging me. Uh, from their ivory tower. 
Uh, but on the other hand, I like being in an office to be around people just for the sake of ignoring them because <laughs> having those people around me, seeing them working, it kind of inspires me to, to mm -hmm. focus a little bit more. And I don't have my gaming PC and my Switch right next to me. Yeah. So it's nice having the choice. Yeah, that, that really helped out a lot. During, I, I think, I don't want to assume or speak for everybody, but I think you know during full-on quarantine, it was rough on a lot of people to be at home all the time, not going anywhere. So by the time that things started opening back up, I was aching to get back to an office, even though I didn't really want to be around those people. But I just wanted to you know, take the hour drive, have a chance to clear my mind, listen to a podcast on the way. Uh, it, it's that separation for me. That's probably the biggest thing, is the separation. Uh, and I took for a while, I would get in my car, drive around the block before I started work, just to have that little snap of separation between work and home life. And shutting off at the end of the day, that's a huge one too. Uh, because it's really easy, especially being remote, checking your phone for Slack messages in the middle of the night and seeing an email. That it could wait until the morning, but sometimes that the brain of your, if you don't respond at 1.01 a.m., then you're gonna be fired. Uh, I shut off my work Slack, put it to uh, do not disturb as soon as I log off for the day. Anyone else? Any questions? Any thoughts? Concerns? Comments? Insults? All right, then. Thank you all for coming. Oh, Dwayne. Uh, I was going to say I can vouch for the um, morning walk. I call it my walk to work. I work from home. And yeah, it's, it's a huge help just to like, clear clear my head the more like, you're ready yeah. for the day. It, I, I tried to keep as much of a standard. I guess standard uh, routine in the morning, wake up, shower. Uh, uh, my, um, an old family friend used to call it wake up, shit, shower, and shave. Uh, obviously, I only do two of those, but um, do that, shower, drive around the block, walk around the block, and then come in, go downstairs, and start the day. Being vulnerable and sharing with oh, thank you for having us again. I'm, I, I'm just trying to start a conversation. So hope, thank you all for coming. That's uh, you being here is a lot more important than me saying anything. Uh, so, thank I'm you. Curious how many people work in organizations and work um, remotely? Um, a lot. Oh, I figured a lot. Um, how many of you have managers that you feel like support? Some of the items that were presented on the slides, things like having the time to unplug. As developers, I, I have emphasized this repeatedly to some of the um, non-developer members of our of our staff. Is developers need heads downtime? If they've got their their uh, Slack on Do Not Disturb, they go on Do Not Disturb for a reason because their heads don't working, and if you bring them out of the developer zone to have a conversation with you about something that you feel is urgent, recognize that you're interrupting their workflow and their thought process. And it takes them what is a five-minute interruption with you, maybe a 15, 20, 30-minute interruption for the developer that you're paying. If it's not something that you absolutely have to have, if they're on Do Not Disturb, leave them a Slack message, they will get back to you when they come out of Do Not Disturb. Yeah. Do, do, well, Okay, yes, <laughs> but we also have to own that ourselves too yes. that when we're in Do Not Disturb mode, yes, that, that we don't that's the do other side of that you don't respond yeah. to the Slack messages that you get when you're in the Do Not, when yeah. you have your, have your Slack on Do Not Disturb. Okay. Yeah, I've had bosses and uh, project managers, just other coworkers who I've suggested that, hey, you know, give me time to go heads down and focus. And some, unfortunately, and I don't work at those companies anymore, they were like, no, you have to be available. I have to see you online on Slack at all times. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you don't have the Slack window focused and open for about 15 minutes, it'll show you, sell you automatically away if you aren't paying attention. And I had a boss who was like, you were away. You weren't working. I, I need to know what you were doing at this time to this time. And I was working. I just wasn't paying attention to the bullshit that was happening in the random channel on the work Slack. Um, but I've also... You know, my, my current project manager that I'm working with, 
we had a sprint retro uh, and one of the things, things we should try, things we should start, things we should make a habit is I just put in there heads down time. Because uh, like you said, um, and I got the statistic from a book called Stolen Focus. I don't remember the author, but the author got the statistic from a scientist. I can't, this is like, uh, well, I heard a tertiary source that I couldn't, can't give the name of, but the study showed that when somebody is interrupted from something, no matter what it is, it takes 23 minutes to get back to what they were doing. And I mean, for that five minute, hey, can you take a look at this? Or an email saying, uh, you have an RSVP to this meeting. Are you going to show up to it? Like two hours before the meeting, even though you show up to everyone, even though you <laughs> don't click accept on all of them. Um, I mean, that's 23 minutes of lost work time. I'm still going to bill for that time because uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm working, but I forget what I was doing. Multitasking can't happen. As much as we say that we can multitask, if you're flipping between multiple projects, it's going to take you that context switching time to do it. And context switching between talking to manager, project manager, client, and going back to coding, at least for me. It's, it takes some focus time. And yeah. I work on opposite coast of most of the people I work with. And um, I put huge blocks of focus time on there because mostly like we do a lot of meetings and I'm not used to having a lot of meetings. Right. And for me, like I know meeting is work time, but it feels like I'm not getting my actual work done. Mm -hmm. So I have huge blocks of time, you know, and and I told like my immediate people like like people I wouldn't mind pinging me or you know that kind of thing, but like because we have a company that's humongous, you know, right? It's like no, I do not want a meeting from X, Y, and Z. But, but I've only done that recently, and I've noticed a huge improvement on my mental health by not having so many meetings and blocking that off. And because before I couldn't say no, but now right. I'm on there, so it's like I'm busy, you know. But before it would be like, oh, can you have a meeting? And it's like. I try to be somewhat flexible. I mean, if there's there's emergencies that come up, yeah. or you know, somebody who is completely blocked and they need my help because apparently I'm the only one in the company who knows the solution, um, I'll be flexible. I'll take a half hour of my focus time to, right. to help them, or I'll hop on a call if it's something like that. But for the most part, having those huge swaths of time blocked out has helped immensely because I don't have to worry about ding, ding, ding. All right. Oh, yeah. 10,000 different. There's a chat for TV shows. There's a chat for editorial. <laughs> like, it's like I, I'm 100% I'm introvert. And I also get distracted very easily. So there's a time and place for me to be social. And then there's a time for me to be like. Yeah. Okay. And, and having all the available chat things available. Um, I've got, what I do, another thing maybe I should put on for the next time is an app called Franz, which lets you have like Discord, Slack, uh, Facebook Messenger, or basically all the chat things in one place. And that's my personal stuff. I've got Drupal Slack, I've got uh, Midcamp Slack for Chicago, a bunch of those on there. But my work Slack is actually in the Slack app in its own screen, completely separate. And I hardly tab over to the personal one unless, you know, I'm taking 15 minutes to myself. You know, I'm going to check in. I'm going to send Dwayne a meme or <laughs> a new new song. Um, you know, I'll do that and then swap back, and I just ignore that window for most of the day until, again, I give myself a little bit of a break. Yeah. But having that separation between the work talk and definitely not work talk. One of my tricks with Slack is I, um, in my preferences, I mute everything except for at my name. So if someone at Diana's, I know I'm gonna get it. But everything else is muted. I'm more like I leave at here or at channel because that's generally the important. Mm -hmm. And within our organization, we just say like, there, here's the, here's how to use Slack in a nice way. <laughs> like here's a respectful way to use Slack. Okay, we are at time. I want to be respectful. Well, actually, it's lunchtime now, so. We've got a uh, camp photo. Mm -hmm. Camp photo. So, yeah, I want to be respectful of the camp photo. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to press the button here. Again, thank you all for coming. I thank really appreciate you. it. Yeah.